Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother forty wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father forty-one. Exactly. Like that. <laughs> Welcome to the fourth episode of the Lizzie Borden Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Barrons. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is a Nine Muses Books production. This is the only podcast devoted to Lizzie Borden and the Borden murders of 4 playing uncle john This coming August 4th will be the 124th anniversary of the Borden murders of 1892. On that day in Fall River, Massachusetts, Andrew Jackson Borden and his wife Abby Durfee Gray Borden were savagely murdered in their home with what is believed to have been a hatchet. Lizzie Borden, Andrew's daughter and Abby's stepdaughter, was subsequently charged with the crime, put on trial, and acquitted. These unsolved murders have appealed to the hundreds of people who flock to Fall River every August 4th to learn more about the crime and more about Lizzie Borden. A great place to do so is the Fall River Historical Society at 451 Rock Street. On August 4th, there will be a special tour that includes a visit to the Borden Exhibit Room where in addition to the usual displays will be some special items that have recently been procured by the society, items that relate to the Borden case. These are items that have never before been seen by the public. More information on the Fall River Historical Society and this special tour on August 4th could be found on their Facebook page, or you can call them at 508-679-1071. Also, the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast is located in the actual house where the Bordens lived for almost two decades before the tragedy. You can rent a room there and spend the night. The booking includes a tour of the house from attic to basement and a breakfast modeled after the Bordens' last meal, sans mud and stew, of course. This is a unique opportunity to live as the Bordens did in the Victorian age, meet with Borden murder experts, and see the actual rooms where the tragedy played out 124 years ago. For many years now, a committed group of folks have thrilled and mystified visitors with their dramatizations of the police investigation after the murders. Okay, spoiler alert, they don't actually reenact the crime. When I was there last year, we wandered from room to room meeting with members of the Fall River Police, medical examiners, surviving members of the family like Uncle John Morse and Lizzie Borden herself. And yes, Andrew and Abby were present, lying in the fatal positions in which they were found on the morning of August 4th, 1892. And these are two actors who stay in character. Today we're going to talk to Joe Radza. Joey lives in Warren, Ohio, is a retired science and gifted education teacher, and every year he makes the trip to Fall River, Massachusetts in order to participate in these August 4th dramatizations at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast Museum. He's going to tell us more about the anniversary of the murders and what it's like to play Uncle John Vinicom Morse in the Lizzie Borden anniversary reenactment at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast. Hi, Joey. Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Hello. Tell us a little bit about what is happening at the Bed and Breakfast on August 4th. Well, on August 4th, we're not really doing a reenactment. We're doing a dramatization. We don't like to use the word reenactment because it sounds like we're going to reenact the two murders. And actually, it's a dramatization of what happened after the murders have been committed. So it's about an hour or two after the death. And uh, we have a cast of actors. Uh, we have a brand new script this year. And the guests uh, will be led to the house, room to room, and in each room there will be reenactors acting out what happened that day, trying to get the main points across to the, the guests who go on tour that day. Uh, each actor will be in period costume uh, and will maintain his or her character 
uh, and will not go out of character. But something different this year, instead of just like watching a play being performed in front of you, uh, we're also going to give the guests uh, a few minutes to question the people in each room. So we'll be doing some ad-libbing while still in character, and they'll be able to investigate uh, on their own what's going on in the house so they can start to form their own opinion. And then before they leave, they will fill in a little form or card, I believe, uh, and they will say they believe committed the murders and why. So they're doing their own private investigation. Yes. Actually, each uh, guest that day at the house uh, who goes on the tour will be deputized. Uh, and will become a part of the investigation. Also in the house will be two very special characters, one of them Andrew Borden himself and Abby Borden. But as reenactors, they have very special jobs. Could you tell us something about that? Well, I can tell you they don't have any lines to learn (laughs) because they uh, will not be alive. Poor Andrew will be under a sheet uh, on the sofa in the sitting room and Abby Borton will be upstairs in the front guest room on the floor, and uh, we are able to recreate the positions uh, of the two victims based on crime scene photographs. So sometimes people say that these two people have the hardest jobs because they have to lay there breathing very slowly so they're not detected and not moving at all, and we are the ones who get to move around. Among some of the other characters that will be in the house that day will be Lizzie Borden herself. I believe uh, it would make sense for her to be in her room as she was on the afternoon of August 4th. Yes, that is the person everyone wants to see. They come to see Lizzie Borden, and the rest of us know that. And she will be in her bedroom, and she will be asked questions by the uh, newspaper reporter. And uh, I'm not sure what kind of a mood she's going to be in that day. She probably will want to be left alone. Uh, Lizzie was a strange character, so I don't know how welcoming she's going to be to guest that day. But they will have the opportunity to question her, see her bedroom, and try to put it all together to see, did she do it or didn't she? And perhaps she will be under the influence of bromo-caffeine, which has been administered to her by Dr. Bowen? Anything's possible. She might be a little fuzzy. Uh, in her answers, and she may not be able to remember everything. She might contradict herself. I- expect anything from Lizzie that day. So also in the house, people will have an opportunity to meet another character, Mr. John Vinicum Morse, who uh, I believe you have the honor of playing this year. Yes, yes, I do. I, I've played John, Uncle John, for at least five or six years now. I've kind of lost track. I'm very close to Uncle John. Yes, he... Uh, He's become a part of me. I've read a lot about him and looked at, of course, any available photographs. Uh, and he's a, he's a fun character to play. And you're right, he did show up the day before, kind of became trapped in this web. <laughs> I don't think he knew what he was walking into. In fact, he becomes the first suspect for the murders, you know, who did it. So Uncle John has a, a couple of interesting days there. Well, could you backtrack a little bit and tell us some of his background, explain who he is in relationship to Lizzie Borden and what his life was like before these events? Okay, Uncle John Morse uh, is uh, Lizzie Borden's uncle. Remember, Andrew Borden was married to Sarah, okay, which is Lizzie's mother. Her biological mother. Biological mother, yes. And, of course, Sarah died, and then later uh, Andrew uh, remarried. And that was Abby Ford, the, 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 one, the stepmother who was murdered. So John is brother of Andrew's first wife, Sarah. So he is biologically Lizzie Borden's uncle. He was basically known for being uh, a butcher. He was a trained butcher. He worked in the meat business, uh, livestock. He uh, farmed and, and traded in livestock. He was a very reserved person, I believe. I read... Uh, that he had uh, one suit, a gray suit that I'll be wearing, and he lived in Hastings, Iowa at that time. And he was visiting back east, and he was staying out in Dartmouth with a past employer of his, Isaac Davis. And he came in on August 3rd to Fall River to see Andrew, 
and also to go out to the Borden Farm in Swansea. And I believe his purpose for coming in was business. He was coming in for business reasons. Now, Andrew had requested Uncle John to come in. He had sent him a letter. Yeah, there had been a letter. He said he could come any time. And I don't think he planned on staying. Um, he didn't bring uh, any uh, clothes with him or anything with him. I believe he was going to come in and see Andrew and then probably go out to the Ford and Farm, come back, say his goodbyes, and then leave. But he got back uh, the evening of August 3rd, I think later than he thought he was going to be, and Abby invited him to spend the night. And he spent the night in the guest room, the front guest room, where Abby would be murdered the next morning. On August 3rd itself, he had walked into a very strange situation because a lot of very odd and peculiar things were going on that day, none the least of which was that the family was suffering from some sort of food poisoning. Everyone was sick. Andrew and Abby had been vomiting. Uh, Abby had gone to Dr. Bowen across the street and said something about uh, she thought they might have been poisoned. They were still feeling ill. He was told that Lizzie was ill as well, although what's interesting is when he came on August 3rd, he did not see Lizzie. Uh, she spent the day in her room, went out that evening, for a, uh, that evening for a short time, and then came back to the house and went straight up to her room. So he says in his test, the trial testimony that he did not see Lizzie at all the day that he arrived, that he only saw her August 4th, the next day, and that was after the murders. She did not have breakfast with them either on August 4th. In fact, on the, on the evening before, the night of August 3rd, he was seated in the sitting room with Andrew Borden, and they were discussing business and possibly uh, having a smoke or discussing the affairs at the, at the farm. And Lizzie came in through the front door and scurried up the stairs. She didn't bother to poke her head in and say hello to Uncle John, who presumably she hasn't seen in a while. But she was in a very strange state of mind at that time. And this is why Uncle John was in a peculiar situation, because while he was sitting there socializing with Andrew and Abby Borden, around the corner, Lizzie Borden was at her friend's house, Alice Russell's house, saying all sorts of crazy things about how she believes someone's trying to harm her family, someone's trying to poison their food. She's sleeping with one eye open because she thinks that someone's trying to hurt them. This is something that must have been very much on her mind when she walked in through that front door and made that split-second decision not to even say hello to her uncle. Well, when she came home, Abby and Andrew and Uncle John were all in the sitting room talking. And there had been a lot of heated feelings in that family. They were not getting along very well due to a previous business dealing that Andrew had where he bought Abby Borden's uh, half-sister's house and nobody told Lizzie about it. And she was upset about that and basically said, what you do for her family, Abby Borden's family, you should do something for us. And that had created a lot of problems. That was the Whitehead house on 4th Street? Yes. Yes, that's the Whitehead house. So they weren't a very communicative family at that time. So I don't know if it would have been unusual for her to come in, know that her stepmom and her father were in the sitting room, that she would have even gone in to say anything to them. But it might have been a little unusual that, you know, she knew that her uncle was there and didn't go in and at least say hello to him. I was thinking more about the state of mind that she would have been in that, that Alice Russell testified about. She was very paranoid. She was very depressed. That may have accounted for her not really wanting to speak to anyone when she got home. Yeah, that's possible. What's interesting is they heard the front door open and close and someone go up the front steps, but it, she was not seen. And they assumed it was her coming in, but they didn't actually see her. Yeah, she was in a depressed state, or at least appeared to be, and frightened by recent events. And also the feeling that her father might have an enemy and that uh, someone was trying to basically... Uh, do in the family in some way, uh, and was frightened, didn't know what she was going to do. I'm sure that all, was all on her mind. If you believe that uh, she was truly frightened, and that wasn't any kind of a setup for what was going to happen the next day. It really depends on how you feel about Lizzie Borden as to whether the conversation she had with Alice Russell was indeed how she felt, that she was fearful and paranoid and depressed, or that she was just prepping for what was going to happen the next day so that Alice Russell would be able to tell the police that Lizzie was fearful that something would happen. So, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. 
Now, Uncle John did spend the night at Abby Borden's invitation. He slept in the guest room. The guest room is adjacent to both Lizzie and Emma's bedrooms. There's a door between the guest room and Lizzie's bedroom, but it's generally kept closed. I mean, there's there's furniture pushed in front of it on, on Lizzie's side. All right, that's correct. She had a desk in front of it on her side, and I'm sure it was kept locked. It was a door that was never open, never used. I do know that when he went upstairs to bed that evening, uh, he, he said um, when he was uh, interviewed that Lizzie's uh, door was shut. He slept in uh, the front guest room. Uh, he said he left his door open all night. It was nice that he was allowed to sleep in the guest room because often when he would stay there, he would stay in a room in the attic next to Bridget Sullivan, the maid's room. But he slept in the guest room uh, that night, and um, I guess nothing appeared to him to be unusual. Yeah, it's a much nicer room. It's a much, much nicer room. As I said, when he uh, he got back to the house, it was starting to get dark, and instead of trying to get back to where he was actually boarding at that time, it was nice that Abby Borden uh, invited him to stay and then possibly just to return the next day. So on the morning of August 4th, Uncle John is, uh, I think by a lot of people's accounts, including his own, he's the first one to awaken and come downstairs. And he hangs out a bit, has breakfast with the family, uh, at least with uh, Andrew and Abby, and then takes off for to visit some relatives. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, he was the first to rise the morning of August 4th. I think it was around 6 a.m. in the morning. He did have breakfast with Andrew and Abby Borden. Lizzie Borden did not take breakfast with her stepmom and dad uh, anymore. And uh, he did. Andrew saw him to the door at about 845, the side door. And he went to the post office to mail a letter. Then he walked up Pleasant Street to visit some relatives on the way Boston Street and stayed there all morning. He had a very strong alibi. He, although he was the first suspect, uh, his alibi was airtight. He was with relatives who could say, yes, he was here with us. People had seen him walking on Pleasant Street. He actually got lost on the way there and stopped a gentleman to ask him directions. He remembered the names of priests that were on the horse car that he took back to Second Street because Andrew had invited him back for the noon meal. So he had a very good alibi. He took a streetcar back. Correct. Yes, he, he walked to his relative's house on Way Boston Street. And then because he wanted obviously wanted to get back to Second Street pretty quick so he wouldn't miss a new meal, he took the horse car back. Yes, to the end of Second Street and then walked down to the Borden house. Uh, he got there about 20 to 12. By the time he gets back, the investigation into the murders is already in full swing. The bodies have been discovered. The police have started to come into the house and investigate it as a crime scene. Things are very different at the house than when he left it. There's a slight contradiction in testimony about how Uncle John arrived back at the house. But it, this, is, this is puzzling. This part of the, the story is puzzling because he reports uh, that when he gets back to the Borden house or the new meal, that he doesn't go directly into the house, that he goes to the backyard, eats a couple of pears, uh, he talks to the gentleman who's stationed outside the side door. I believe it was Charles Sawyer who had been deputized, a big guy to, to you know, uh, watch who was going in to the house, not to let pe- other, you know, people come in. And he doesn't say that he observed anything out of the ordinary. Yet, at the same time, you hear that a large group of people were gathering around the front of the house in the street, that uh, the news of the murders had spread very quickly, that there were police officers going in and out, not only the house, but in and out of the barn. And there is a contradiction there between the calm approach he has to the house and what he doesn't observe and what other people say was going on at that time. So that is a, a mystery. I've always wondered, you know, exactly what the time frame was there uh, or who possibly was not being truthful. I don't know. The whole business of him standing in the backyard and eating pears? Well, and he, he may have been an unusual man, but at the same time, I would think that if you came to the house where you were staying and people were gathered outside and you observed police officers, that your first thought would be, oh, my goodness, something has happened here. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And then you would want to go in and investigate what is going on. I'm not so sure you would take the time to leisurely stroll to the backyard and have a little snack uh, before lunch and then mosey on into the house. So that's always been a strange part of this story. You know, it's also a matter of what people remembered and what they didn't, you know, remember. Maybe he got his story wrong. I don't know. But, you know, it's hard to believe that you wouldn't be able to remember, you know, whether you marched up into the house and went in and saw what was happening or that you went to the backyard. Time is an important part of the story. You know, when were certain things happening? When were they reported to have been happening? It may be two different things. You know, all we have to go on are people's testimony and observations that could be right or wrong in terms of bad memory or not being truthful uh, or could be right. It's a puzzle where sometimes the pieces don't quite fit together, so you try to pull them together the best you can, but that's what makes this story so fascinating. Because the puzzles don't fit, but the pieces don't fit so well, there's always room for you to say, well, here's what I think probably happened. So John Morse comes home, he gets entangled in this affair. He's actually gets caught up in the net and becomes part of the the house confinement that the Borden family is now yes. subjected to. So for several days, he's staying with them. Yes. Yes. In fact, um, he learns pretty quickly that people are thinking uh, that he is most likely the murderer uh, the next day, even though there are police officers stationed around the house, he decides to walk down to the nearby post office to mail a letter. And as he's walking, he begins to notice that there's a crowd following him. And uh, almost a mob mentality starts to take place around him. Uh, and the police officer, in a sense, rescues him and walks him back to the house. And that's, I think, when he learns that people are looking at him and saying, you know, you know, you're a man, a butcher by trade, and you came here. You don't actually live here. You just showed up uh, yesterday uh, or the day before yesterday at that time. What are you doing here? Did you, you did you do this? Because who else would have been there around that time? So he learns pretty quickly that he is thought to be the one who did it. But then, of course, just as quickly, the police realized that according to everyone's answers when they interviewed, that he couldn't have done it because you can't be in two different places at the same time. And then that's when people begin to wake up to the fact that uh, it looks like the, the finger now is pointing towards Lizzie Borden. Well, Joey, we're going to take a quick break now. You've been listening to the Lizzie Borden podcast, and our guest is Joey Radza, a key player in the dramatization at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast in Fall River this coming August 4th. We'll continue after this word from Nine Muses Books. Nine Muses Books is proud to sponsor the Lizzie Borden podcast. Nine Muses Books is an independent press featuring the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series written by author Richard Behrens. These well-crafted comic mysteries set a fictionalized Lizzie as a teenage detective against a real Victorian-era Fall River, Massachusetts. The characters are remarkably vivid. The narrative is intellectually stimulating, and as one critic has described it, author Richard Behrens really knows how to toss delightfully deceptive literary curveballs that keep the reader mystified until just that penultimate perfect moment. Michael Martins of the Fall River Historical Society has called these stories a must-read for all those intrigued by Fall River history, mystery, and, of course, Lizzie Borden. Shelley Diesick of the Lizzie Borden Warps and Wefts blog has written that the Lizzie Borden girl detective stories are so much fun, it's nearly criminal. The Lizzie Borden girl detective mysteries can be found on Amazon in ebook format, and most books are offered as free downloads. In addition to these short stories, there is also the full-length novel The Minuscule Monk, offered in both print book and ebook format. Formats. When a dead body mysteriously appears in the basement of her father's furniture store, 15-year-old Lizzie Andrew Borden takes on the case. Accompanied by an eccentric millionaire who campaigns to extend the vote to animals, a Boston Terrier trained to sniff out crooked politicians, and a boy detective who believes that the entire universe is inside his own head. Lizzie follows a trail of taxidermy tools and Civil War bushwhackers to the minuscule monk, a legendary gunslinger whose mummified body will bring a punter's pot to anyone who can deliver it to the New York gangster who has been hunting the monk for decades. With such high stakes, everyone has a motive for murder, yet everyone seems innocent. 
History and mystery fans alike will find The Minuscule Monk a thoroughly engaging read. For more information, go to lizzieborden.girldetective.com and sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, and listen to our podcasts on iTunes. Visit the Garden Bay Films channel on YouTube to see special visual editions of the podcast as well as the Lizzie miniseries. And now, back to the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Welcome back to the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Our guest today is Joey Radza, a retired science and gifted education teacher from Warren, Ohio, who treks to Fall River every August 4th to participate in the anniversary dramatization at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast Museum. We're discussing John Vinicum Morse, Lizzie Borden's Uncle John, who appeared in Fall River the day before the murders with just the suit on his back and walked into a home that was ready to explode with murder and mayhem. So, Joey, in the uh, day or two after the murders, Uncle John was seriously considered as a suspect. Being that you play the man in the dramatization, have you drawn any conclusions at all about his role in this affair? Right. Well, my thoughts about Uncle John was um, he did get caught up in this. I don't believe he's had anything to do with the actual murders, the swinging of the hatchet. But I find it hard to believe that he was not able to figure out what happened. I think a lot of people knew what happened. They just weren't talking. So uh, he may not have been the murderer. Whether or not he had anything to do with the planning of the murders, I don't know. I don't think he did. But after the fact, do I think he uh, knew what happened in that house on August 4th? Yes, I do. I believe that for the rest of his life, he knew exactly what happened that day. And for reasons only known to himself, he kept quiet. They could be to protect his niece. You know, blood is thicker than water, I guess. Uh, but uh, I would find it hard to believe that anybody could be so close to where it happened and know all the people involved and know the histories of all these people and not be, you know, not walk away knowing what happened. I find it poignant that in all his time out West, he continued a correspondence with Emma Borden, but Uncle John actually says at the preliminary hearing, he says uh, he's never received a letter from Lizzie. Emma, well, Emma was older, obviously, nine years older than Lizzie. So she probably had more time to form a bond with her uncle because she uh, was older than Lizzie, of course, when her mother, Sarah, her biological mother died and probably had more um, communication with her uncle her whole life. But Lizzie didn't remember her real mother very much, if at all, and, and Uncle John was more of a stranger to her, I suppose. Yeah, Emma was about uh, 10 or 11 when the mother died, so she would have had more years of her childhood where she actually remembered Uncle John as being an immediate member of the family. Exactly. So John Morris testifies at the inquest, he testifies at the preliminary hearing and the trial, his story is relatively stable and consistent. There is those uh, those weirdnesses that we discussed earlier, but beyond that, it's uh, he pretty much uh, follows the same timeline that everyone agrees upon. The one that was kind of beaded out by Bridget Sullivan. What happened that morning in terms of everybody waking up, having breakfast, who left the house during what time period? And he ha he does has, as you say, an airtight alibi that shows that he was not any physical agent who used the hatchet to commit the murders. So for the rest of his life, uh, what, what happened to him in the years after the trial? How did he live out the rest of his life? He hangs around for a while, of course, but ultimately he ends up back out west. I don't believe he ever travels east again. He goes on about his life in dealing with cattle and other livestock. One thing I wanted to note here that, that I've not said is that I believe, according to what I've read, that Andrew Borden and John Morse were friends, more than just you married my you know, sister. But I believe they were actually friends as well as, in terms of personal friends, as well as business friends. And I think they trusted each other. I think they shared many of the same characteristics, which is why Uncle John probably felt that he'd lost not only his sister's uh, husband in that sense, but that he'd lost a friend. So I think there was a nice relationship there between them. But afterwards, after, of course, Lizzie and Emma move up to Maple Croft, up on French Street and so on, I don't really think there is any you know, reason for him to come back east. I'm sure Emma and Uncle John probably continue to correspond. 
he just sort of goes on about his life. Not a whole lot is known about him afterwards. He tends to live with different people at various times. He tends to board with people rather than have his own place. One thing I found recently, it, it hit me, is that on, on August 4th, 1892, Uncle John was 59 years old. And this year, uh, when I play Uncle John on August 4th, I am 59 years old. Oh, no. That's a, a, a creepy time-space configuration. Yeah, well, yeah. And here is something else that happened. One evening when I'm there, I need to be at a hotel rather than at the bed and breakfast. The only hotel I could find that had a room the evening I needed it was in Dartmouth, the oh. same town <laughs> where Uncle John was staying when he came to visit the Bordens on August 3rd. And I'm thinking, this is getting to be really interesting here. <laughs> it's not called the Davis Hotel, is it? No, no, no. It hasn't gone that far yet. With a horse corral in the back? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. When I go there, I'll, I'll be using a, a horseless carriage. In regard to Uncle John Morris staying in the house the night of the murders, after the police have done their investigation, there was a police stationed outside the house. Uncle John goes into the guest room where the murders occurred and sleeps there for the night. Now, that room must have been, there must have been quite a scene in that room because there was blood stains on the wall. They had removed some of the carpet where Abby had been lying face down, but there must have been a lot of residue from that event. And on top of that, the bodies of Andrew and Abby Borden were just down below in the dining room, having been autopsied. They were there for the night. Well, you know, you have to look at this from the perspective of 1892. You know, from the year, you know, 2016 that it is today, uh, yes, that would be really peculiar to have the bodies kept in the house. For even anyone to be able to sleep in the house today, would I think that would be impossible. It would be a crime scene. Everything would have been roped off. But uh, back then, funerals were held in the house. They weren't held at funeral parlors. Death, I believe, was a much more common event back then. People didn't live as long. Medicine, of course, wasn't like what we have today. So I think the 1892 person, like Uncle John, probably faced death in a different way than we do today. Whether he had any qualms about staying in that, in that room, I don't know, but he did. I find that hard to believe. You know, it seems cold to me for some reason, very impersonal. But having the bodies kept in the house, I don't think was unusual. Having them autopsy there that day it may have been something a little out of the ordinary. And also what you have working against you is that you have weird eyebrows. Well, at least Uncle John did. You don't. You, uh, you're, you were a trained butcher. You came over to stay. You didn't even bring a toothbrush. So you either have really bad dental hygiene or you're a psychotic murderer. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, poor Uncle John, you know, I guess if you are near two hatchet murders and you're a butcher, people can put things together in a certain way. So possibly if he had been a door-to-door -door salesman or something, it wouldn't have looked so bad for him. But being a butcher, showing up unexpected, even though, as you said before, he was expected sometime because uh, Andrew Borden had written a letter to him, business-type letter, saying, I need to see you. Yeah, to show up unexpectedly, to have such a bloody murder take place, and you are a butcher, to have mysterious eyebrows, I suppose, and to walk into all of this, like what's happened here, People are going to look at you and say, hmm, I don't know about you. You're <laughs> awfully strange. <laughs> so. Well, over the years, a lot of people have made a big deal out of him appearing out of nowhere. But I was reading, I think it was the preliminary hearing testimony, where Knowlton is interrogating him about why he arrived. And he, uh, Uncle John pulls a letter out of his pocket while he's sitting on the witness stand. And he says, here's the letter that Andrew Borden sent me. And Knowlton says, may I have that? And and he hands it to him in the courtroom. That would be a great letter to, to see, wouldn't it? Oh, I'd love, do you know where it is? <laughs> no, it disappeared. It, it vanished from history. It's gone. Yeah, well, he could be somewhere. Maybe Knowlton gave it back to him. Maybe Knowlton held on to it and it's buried in an archive somewhere. My guess, he probably would give, give him the letter back, I, I would imagine. We have a lot of handwritten letters from Lizzie after the murders. We would love to have handwritten letters from those family members before the murders. Tell me a little bit about your personal interest in the Lizzie Borden case. How far back does that go? What got you interested in it? How many years have you been doing this? 
uh, you know, I can answer that question right to the point. I am in college. It is 1975. I turn on the television, and the legend of Lizzie Borden, the television film starring Elizabeth Montgomery as Lizzie Borden, comes on. I watch it, and by the time that television movie is over, I am hooked. <laughs> Within a week, I'm at the library checking out books, and from then on, I am into this case. So I can trace it back to 1975, so what, what would that be? 41 years, <laughs> if I'm doing the math correctly. So I've been doing this for quite a, a long time, but that's what did it. And I still get a thrill being in the uh, Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast Museum, putting in that movie, because uh, they have the DVD player and the uh, television there that you can wheel out from the closet, and watching the movie that started it all in the house where it happened. I still get a big kick out of that. But that's when my interest started. And speaking to other people who are fascinated by this case, uh, I'm amazed how many other people were watching that television film at the same time I was. I don't know if it had some special power over people, but it was just so fascinating. And the mystery of it. And, and you know, it has it all. It has the mystery. It has drama. It has horror. You know, it has everything. So it's like a full menu. And it has the woman from Bewitched? Yes. And, of course, I thought Elizabeth Montgomery did an outstanding job in that part. I really do. I think, you know, it's probably one of the best things she ever did. In fact, even today, when I picture Lizzie Borden in my mind, she'll still come up. <laughs> Elizabeth Montgomery still appears because, you know, all we have to go on with the real Lizzie Borden are still photographs. And to a whole generation of people to this day say Lizzie Borden, she's the one who killed her parents. And a, a good subset of those people say she's the one who killed her parents in the nude because of that movie. Right. So it was an excellent television film. Did it get everything correct as far as we know? No, it didn't. <laughs> no. And you know what? The most amazing thing is Uncle John isn't even in that television film. They cut him out. My character isn't even there. They cut him they out just completely. They cut him out entirely. And they cut him out from the more recent movie, Lizzie Borden Took an Axe with Christina Ricci. Again, Uncle John got the axe. I don't know why. I, I try not to take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they figured in a short format where they have an hour and 20 minutes to tell the story that introducing Uncle John would, uh, well, first of all, it would be paying another actor. Uncle John's involvement in this story has always fascinated me. It's always been an integral part of the events, even though by, by all accounts, and I, I'm with you in agreeing that he was innocent of the murders, being caught up in those events is a gripping story. Yes, well, just the fact that he's present, he's an observer of all that happened, a possible participant in it. As I said before, I believe that he was aware enough to know what happened that day. I don't think he ever said to anyone, as far as I know, what he thought happened that day. But boy, would I enjoy hearing the conversations that went on in that house between Lizzie Borden and her Uncle John and when the police weren't present. I mean, you know, did he ever say to his niece, did you do this? You know, you can tell me. You know, I won't give you away. You know, just tell me what happened. But it's important to note that Lizzie Borden was found not guilty. That needs to be remembered, you know, after the trial in June of 1893. Of course, some testimony in, in wasn't permitted. I, mean, I know you can make a case that if certain things had been permitted in it to be used in the trial, that the outcome may have been different. But in the end, according to history, she was found not guilty, and therefore we can't say today that she did it. And I always tell people, because they ask me, because they know I do this, did she do it? And I will say to them, I am 99.99% sure she did it. But I, no one can be 100% sure. I believe everyone knew. I believe Emma Borden knew, Uncle John knew, her uh, Lizzie's friend Alice Russell knew, the neighbor, Mrs. Churchill knew. I think they all knew what happened. I don't think anybody was talking. I think the police knew what happened that day as well. You know, you know, sometimes trials can be held, as we know, where the person looks awfully guilty and they're not found guilty. These people knew 
But again, if you go back to the 1890s, that period, people didn't talk back then, I think. I think people minded their own business, refused to talk about this crime after all was said and done, and it was almost treated as something obscene that wasn't brought out in public by good people, but they knew. Maybe someday a journal or a diary will be found. Or Jennings notebooks? Yes. Supposedly, you know, because Jennings, of course, was her attorney, supposedly an attorney will ask, did you do this? You know, because I have to know how to defend you. So I'm sure he must have asked her. Now, whether or not she said yes or no, maybe that, you know, he has that documented somewhere there. But it will be fascinating because if that comes out, what's interesting is if it were to come out, it would certainly change a lot of things. I don't even know if it would have the same appeal that it does. Because it's the ultimate whodunit mystery. There's an enduring fascination in our popular culture with Lizzie Borden. Right, well, England has Jack the Ripper, and we have Lizzie Borden. <laughs> well, Lizzie Borden's become like uh, like folklore now. It's amazing that she's not even in the dictionary. You know what I mean? She's, she's gone beyond just being a woman accused of two murders and being found not guilty. So much has been written, and so much has been bought about this crime that it, it, she's gone on to live for the ages now. She's, she's become a cultural icon. The recent wave of interest uh, with the Christina Ricci movie and television show, whether anyone liked those movies or didn't like them, they were symptomatic of Lizzie Borden being a cultural icon. There are certain expectations that we have of the, the Lizzie Borden that we have in our imaginations. Right, well, I've even heard her name used in you know, television comedy shows where, you know, somebody will use it like as an insult. They'll, they'll call somebody else, a, you know, Lizzie Borden, uh, using it in that way. I think it's just a name that people associate now with two of the most famous murders probably ever committed in this country. You know, the O.J. Simpson of her time. I think it was the first time that the wire services were used where you could live in Los Angeles and pick up the morning newspaper and read about Lizzie Borden across the country. So, of course, it became the topic of the day. You know, did she or didn't she? You know, and I can only imagine all the arguments people probably had with each other. And she did it. No, she didn't. Yes, she did. You know, so I, I it, even, it, it not only catches our interest today, uh, it caught the interest of the entire world at the time that it was taking place. Yeah, I heard it was even being reported in Tokyo. Wow. <laughs> I believe it, you know, because it was a fascinating crime. It wouldn't have been half as fascinating if she had been a man. Sometimes it hits me, that, you know, if I'm, especially if I'm there at the house, I'll sit and I'll, you know, I'll think about it and I'll say, wait, this was really a terrible thing that happened here. Yes, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to study, you know, an interesting case to study. The people are fascinating, but when it comes down to it, these two people lost their lives in the most brutal way. Time has kind of dulled that feeling of, you know, how horrible it is. Every once in a while, it kind of hits you that this was, this is not a nice thing. You know, and that's why with the dramatization, uh, we try to be as respectful as we possibly can we're not out to uh, sensationalize it or to um, play up the gory aspects of it. it it's more, uh, we approach it more like it's a history lesson. It is a, a part of Fall River history. It's a part of the history of law, women's studies. I mean, it falls into so many different categories. Yeah, that to give a lesson like this to people, I think it is necessary today. And it's always nice to see young people involved. Well, Joey, unfortunately, we, we're running out of time. I want to thank you so much for taking your time to share this all with us. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much for asking me to participate. I enjoyed it. I, I enjoy talking about this at any, any time with anyone. So, <laughs> but what an honor. I, I appreciate it, you know, to talk to you, a, a published author. <laughs> I, of all the published authors about Lizzie Borden, I am the least historically accurate. <laughs> oh, but I find your books fun. They're fun. <laughs> I mean, you can't always read the police report. Sometimes it's just fascinating. That the whole idea of Lizzie Borden, you know, fiction is a whole other topic. Most people's Lizzie Borden fiction is focused on the horror and the murders. I, I try to make comedy out of it in a respectful way, actually presenting... Right presenting the Bordens as as people and, and also showing Lizzie in a positive light. 
and trying to keep a sense of humor about the whole thing. You know, when I think of your book, I just think that I, the word that always comes to my mind isn't really comedy. It's like they're delightful. Oh, yeah. They're just fun. They're fun reads. It's, they're delightful. And, you know, you don't usually hear that word used very often with Lizzie Ford. Okay, well, thank you so much, Joey. Uh, we look forward to having you back again because in the future we're going to have more stuff about John Vinicom Morris on our show. I plan to have some sort of series, which is the Cast of Characters series. When we get to Uncle John, I'm, I'm definitely going to gonna give you a call. Oh, great. Okay, well, I will definitely see you there. You have been listening to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 4, Playing Uncle John with Joey Radza. Next episode, we're going to continue with the Lizzie Borden Primer with author Sarah Miller. This podcast was written and produced by Nine Muses Books and engineered by Mason Amadeus. The theme music was composed and performed by Melora Krieger. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is sponsored by Nine Muses Books and the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. More information can be found at www.lizziebordenpodcast.com and lizziebordengirldetective.com. Thank you.